Thank you for joining us for today's educational seminar, Successful Spring Vegetable Gardening. Herman? Thank you, Ginger. Uh, I got a lot to talk about, and I don't know where to start. First of all, I am economical. I am frugal. I don't like the word cheap. Jackie and I moved to Texas City, and in our backyard, the size is 43 feet by 58 feet. So that's the area that I am working now. In there, I grow vegetables in the ground and in containers. I have 11 citrus. That's what I had before the freeze. I've got three peach trees. I've got some old roses. And I grow okra in a grassy area because I don't have enough room to plant it elsewhere in the actual garden. This year, this morning, the soil temperature was 47 degrees, and we're going to talk about that later on, okay? I have been in a lot of backyards of other master gardeners and my own and took a lot of photographs, and I've learned a lot there. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do today is take into consideration what do you want to know, what do you need to know, failures by me and others, and some of the information is going to be nice to know. It's something you don't have to know, but it's really nice to know. Uh, okay. Um, I guess I'm going to start now. Okay. In your orchard or garden, there is no right or wrong. It is what works best for you. And each of us have different techniques. I do not bad mouth any of them. And as long as it works for you, that's great because that's all we're interested in. You're not trying to please me, you're trying to please yourself, okay? Why grow vegetables? I grow a garden because you can't find good fresh okra anywhere out there except if you grow it yourself. So that's one of the reasons why I grow a vegetable garden. Okay, if this started out was I had you grow homegrown vegetables that can be fresh. That's how it was originally written, but my wife changed that. Reason I say can be because a lot of times we harvest the vegetable, we lay it on the counter, it's not refrigerated and eventually it starts to shrivel and it's not that fresh vegetable that you would like to have. Gardening is an exercise, maybe not much, but it's some and it's fun, it's calming and it's a learning experience. Because of corn worm, because of the corn earworm, uh, corn is normally sprayed 13 to 17 times with chemicals to control that worm because when we get that corn out of the store, we don't want that worm in the end of it. At home, we control the chemicals, if any, that we use. And we need to take into consideration integrated pest management. That means if we have insects there, how much damage can you or will you accept to your plants or your fruit? You know? Now, 45% of the retail cost of food is transportation and energy. So when you raise that vegetable at home, uh, you've actually saved some energy somewhere and you might wanna take into consideration the carbon footprint. If you're buying back guano from South America, how much energy does that cost or take to bring that uh, fertilizer up here to you? I recommend that we keep some kind of records. The reason being is because we forget. Record all activities, spraying, insects, and production. We might to want to refer back to that later on so that we will remember what plants did well and when we planted them, what worked. This, the photo, uh, the date of this photo is uh, 2002. In a garden, kids, they have to learn to read to plant. They need their math, nature, rewards, and it's patience. And it also creates memories. Freeze dates, this is for Houston. February the 14th has a 50% of chance of a, has a 50 chance of a freeze. This year, what was it, 15th of February? Very cold. And that has some other effects on us that's coming up. We need to take into consideration that microclimate in our yard, that little spot that doesn't freeze, that things grow best in. When I plant a garden, I think of a garden as 365 days a year. 
And it's pretty easy to do with a piece of frost guard to protect some of your plants at a particular time. Quite often, you've got a nice little garden in the winter and the fall and one frost will knock it out. So one piece of frost guard can take care of that one night so that you have that vegetables later on in the winter or whatever. When it comes to sunlight, uh, the light requirements of plants are different. The plants that require full sun is the plants that usually produce a fruit or a root, okay? So they require full sun. The plants that or can take some shade are the plants that have large leaves. And that's those on the right. They have very large leaves. And you look at the collars and cabbage and all that, uh, they do require a lot of sunlight. Okay, we need to take into consideration. This is beside my house. And uh, on the this fence is running uh, east and west. And, and I looked at the shade that this fence provides on my side of the property. On the 3rd of January, I had 13 feet of shaded grass. February the 3rd, I had seven feet of shaded grass. So that means in the deep winter, I really can't plant a, plant a garden right here. But in the summertime, on the other side of the garden, on the north side of my yard, there'll be sunlight in the, in the winter, but not in midsummer. So we need to look at that dead spot, such as our house, does it produce a shadow that, cre that creates a place that doesn't have full sun? When it comes to garden size, it's important. How much area do you have with full sun? What garden tools do you have? Uh, one of the things I have to take into consideration during this program, because some of us have four by four foot gardens, some of us have larger gardens, and some people may have a garden that they're using a tractor in. So when you're starting out, what's the least amount of tools that you can get by with? Probably a shovel, a hand trial. That's probably really all you need, okay? You want to take into consideration when you raise a garden, what do you eat? How much time do you have? Because when you start a large garden and then you run out of time later and you can't take care of it, you are defeated by that garden. What is the cost of purchase and the quality of what you want to eat? It may be cheaper or more economical to purchase this. What do you want to plant? Will it grow here? And then we have this thing that we call a challenge. You know? Challenges drive us. Let's look at the type of garden that we want. We may want a garden that's a couple of bales of hay, planted in the hay. We may want a garden like top right on the potting soil. The bottom of that container is slit so that the moisture will uh, leach out so that it doesn't stay soggy or too wet in there. That's a portable garden. Where do you want it? You want the sunlight first. And it also, normally these have the adequate nutrients in it for about three months. So a couple of broccoli plants or whatever you want to plant in it. The one on the right, those tall beds about two feet high, you don't have to stoop over. They're right at the right height for some of us. It doesn't have to be full of dirt, neck or soil. There could be other things in there below there, such as uh, star foam or anything to occupy that space to get that soil level up there where you can handle it. Of course, down on the left, that's the guy that's got the tractor. The family or families got together, they got a piece of property, and that's where they're raising their vegetables, okay? The one on the right, that could be that person in the wheelchair that hasn't given up on gardening yet. The depth of that soil is probably eight to 12 inches deep or a person who can stand and can't stoop at all. That could be very, very beneficial to that particular person. When it comes to raised bed construction, we want the location. We want full sun. We would like to have airflow. And the reason being is because humidity 
is one of our biggest problems of fungus in Galveston County. So that early morning airflow will remove that moisture off of those leaves. And we need a water hose because we know we're going to need it in the midsummer. We can use to line this garden wood, concrete blocks, whatever you have. Let's use that imagination. We would like to have it about 12 to 18 inches high. We wanted to take into consideration drainage because that's the most important, we important thing that we need on the roots. And what about those tree roots from that tree over there? Those tree roots are going to find this and there's going to be nutrients and water in there. So we have to try to be far enough away from that. When we build a bed, if you're sitting on top of carpet grass, a few sheets of uh, newspaper will kill that grass and you cover it with soil, it'll do very well. However, if you have Bermuda grass, it's recommended that you probably use Roundup to kill it because once that Bermuda grass gets in that garden, it is very difficult to get it out. We don't want to dig a hole and fill it with soil. If you do that in our heavy gumbo, it's like a tub. And in the winter time and when it rains, the tub is full of water and your plants roots are going to drown. And we're going to also talk about imported soil. Okay, We're going to talk about the fire ants in that bed because those fire ants like that high soil. When those fire ants are in there, if you irritate them, they're going to move. You don't have to use any chemicals. Okay, the raised bed construction. This is my bed my way. I'm economical. So what I have is two by 12s, 14 feet long, and they are treated. I have some rebar that's cut, to, that's five eighths inch in diameter and cut 30 inches long. The rebar is driven into the ground or pressed into the ground with the help of a 12 inch crest or pipe wrench. The timber is laid up against the timbers, laid up against the rebar, and that is filled full of soil and the soil pressure keeps the timber in place. At any unions or corners, I will use newspaper or something like that that will decompose over a period of time to hold back the soil in the bed. Now, go create your own bed. Now, one thing you might want to take into consideration if you have two beds, do you want to drive the lawnmower down between them? Or are you going to use a weed eater to control the grass or weeds in there? Now that we started about a bed, let's look at the root system. Beets, lettuce, and onions have a root system probably just a little over 12 inches deep. So that means they need regular water often. Okay. And these others have different depth roots. So this is what we want to think about. We want to know what's in the ground because this is what we're working with. Each line on this chart is about a foot apart. So uh, broccoli, carrot, cauliflower, celery, and spinach have roots about two feet deep. Tomato plants in ideal condition, the roots will grow about 10 feet deep, but we don't have those ideal conditions down here. That bed that you built, we need some soil in it. And soil is a storehouse for nutrients, organic matter, air, and water. Now, when you take that perfect garden mix and it's just right for your seeds or your roots, when you pick it up, there should be about 50% solids there, 25% air, and 25% water. If you're at 50% water, that means your plants are drowning. So we need that air. The growing media supports and anchors the roots of your plants. The controversy is topsoil because it has weeds. Even if we don't have topsoil with weeds, the wind or the birds are going to bring your weeds to you. Or you may even bring some in yourself. Now, I want to mention something here, and that is the garden mix that we go out and buy. You can buy a garden mix or rose mix or whatever. And when you take this home and you put it in your garden, I want you to look at it real careful because in there will probably be some wood chips. Those wood chips 
are going to take the nitrogen that's in that soil and that wood chips are going to try to decompose. And when they are decomposing, they will tie up the nitrogen and your plants are not going to get it. This is why many a young person's garden fails because there's not adequate nitrogen. They don't realize what's happening. Now, because the nitrogen is tied up, if you're going to plant something in here, you would like to add or supplement the nitrogen uh, to this mixture. Once you get the right amount of nitrogen, your plants should grow very well. Now, once the wood chips decompose, you now have compost. And at that time, the nitrogen that was being used for the wood chips is released back into the soil for your plants. Now, another disadvantage of this is that when you start out with a bed that's 12 inches high, as the wood chips decompose a year later, your bed is not going to be 12 inches high. It'll probably be more like 10 inches high because the wood chips have decomposed. This is a photograph of the soil between Dickinson and Leak City on Highway 3. This is the old truck farms. They're no longer there, but this is what we would really like to have in our garden, but we know what's going to happen up there. It'll be all covered with concrete. Now, soil improvements. Even though our soil is as good as we think it is, we always like to make some kind of improvements. Organic matter, compost, leaves, helps loosen tight soil. That's that heavy gumbo that we all complain about. Organic matter helps sand hold moisture. That means you don't have to uh, water it as often and it also helps it hold the nutrients in the soil. Sand may be added to heavy soil to help break it up. Now composted leaves, straw, dry manure, composted in a garden works very well. We can also take those grass clippings. Grass clippings because they're green have nitrogen in them. Once they dry, they're now called their brown material. We also can what they call use green manuring, which is nitrogen. Okay, this is the brown leaves. When you put this in your garden, that's just like those wood chips. It has to break down. So you need to supplement it with some nitrogen. Okay, the green manure, like the green grass or plants like that that you put in there, that is nitrogen and it's going to break down pretty quick. We have what they call trench composting. That's in your garden. You have the table scraps. You go out and dig a little trench. You cover it up. A week later, you go back. And most of it's going to be gone. Now, we have what they call sheet composting. You can take your garden and throw all these leaves and stuff on top of it and till it in. Or you can do what they call green manure. This is uh, Elbon rye, which is planted for a reason. When it is turned under, it decomposes. And that green grass having nitrogen, decom it decomposes fast and you have nitrogen for your next crop. Okay, let's look at the fertilizer we're going to use in the soil. Soil, we have gravel, sand, loam, clay, and silt. We would like to have loam, but some of us don't have that. Some of us have that heavy clay, which works real good. It has all the nutrients we need except nitrogen. So we're going to have to supplement nitrogen in the clay. The sand, a lot of your nutrients leach out, and we're going to have to probably fertilize it and fairly often, OK? What I want to do here is look at the bottom on the left, and you've got two teardrops. One is a long teardrop. In sand, if you have an emitter that puts out a small amount of water, that water will make a long teardrop in the sand. That means if you're using emitters, you're going to have to use more emitters for a shorter period of time. The teardrop on the right is in heavy soil. That means because it blooms out, that means you can use less emitters for a longer period of time. When we talk about the fertilizer that most of us use, it's a granular fertilizer. Generally speaking, two cups is equal to a pound. We do not want a weed killer in it. 
Therefore, the fertilizer we have in the garage, we want to look at it real careful before we use it. Because if it's used in the yard, it may have a weed killer in it. And that's what we don't want. Everything in our garden is a broadleaf weed to the weed killer. Nitrogen leaches in the soil. It moves. On the teardrop on the left, in that sandy soil, if you spread your nitrogen out, you water it in, and it starts moving down into the soil. Then if you get a large rain, the large rain can move it further and further down. And if you get a lot of large rains, it can eventually move it down to where your plant roots can't get it. So in that sand, we want light applications, but more of them. In the heavy soil, we can use less applications, but a little bit heavier amount. The one thing we don't want to do is we don't put all, we don't want to put all this fertilizer out and get that big rain that washes it into the bayou because we pay for it. Now, uh, phosphorus is fairly stable in the soil. If you're using a triple 13 or with a middle number, uh, that number can eventually build up to levels to where it can have a, a negative impact on your plants. So, but most of the time, most of us don't have to worry about that, but we want to take it or we want to just remember that or put it back there in that mind and remember it. Potassium has some movement in the soil. Okay. Now let's look at the triple 13. Triple 13 is 13% nitrogen, 13% phosphorus, and 13% potassium. That's what, 39% uh, of chemicals in that bag? The rest of it is trash. So in the 15510, which is a yard fertilizer, which works pretty good in our gardens and fruit trees, is 15% nitrogen. The 2100 has sulfur in it. That means there's 21% nitrogen, which is almost twice as much nitrogen as the triple 13. So you want to take that into consideration when you're using it. The sulfur. The negative point on the sulfur is that if you use this fertilizer with un fertilizing onions, the onions may become hot in flavor. However, around pecan trees it's beneficial because it has a tendency to lower the pH of the soil. I like the 4600. There are some negative things about it. The positive is 4600, when you sprinkle this out on the ground and you water it in with about a quarter of an inch of rain or more, that urea is in the form that those plants can use almost immediately. I have sprinkled it on the ground around green beans, watered in, and two days later, the beans are turning greener. Beautiful. The negative point is, is that when you open that bag and if it stays open, it will absorb moisture out of the air and turn hard as a rock. So you want to protect it, what you have left from the uh, moisture. When it comes to organic uh, fertilizers, there's different analysis on a lot of it. There's some of it that has about a 6% nitrogen in there. And uh, usually it can be more expensive than some of your commercial fertilizers. Okay, uh, if you do a soil sample and you come back that, back that you need some trace elements, at Stanton's and Alvin, they have a blend of 15, 5, 10 that does have some trace elements in it. I would not use it unless I had a soil sample saying that I need it. When it comes to a soil sample, uh, here at the Extension Office, there are containers and uh, literature or pamphlets that tell you how to pull your soil sample. And when you fill that out, you tell them what you're going to plant. When a and sends your results back, they give you a recommendation on what fertilized application to use in that particular soil. I collect some rainwater. I collect about 300 gallons of rainwater. There's no chlorine in it because some plants don't like that chlorine. There's no salts. It's like pennies from heaven. I reduce the runoff by a little bit and a 55 gallon drum of water in the spring will water a 10 by eight foot garden bed one time. Now, when I collect this, I cover it for mosquitoes and these containers are setting up high on some blocks so that 
I can siphon it out to where I want it. I don't want to have to tote it. I'm getting older. Okay, let's look at the pH of the soil. If most of us are somewhere close to a pH of seven in our area, there's some that is a little bit higher. And when you look at the seven down the middle, what this means is that at a pH of seven, these nutrients are readily available to our plants. As the pH gets higher, there are some nutrients that it's harder for our plants roots to pick up. As the pH gets lower, the same thing happens. So somewhere around about a seven is, or just under seven is where most of us want to be. And that is a good place. Okay, now if you're from East Texas, you've moved down here, don't put no lime on that garden until you run a soil test and you still probably won't have to put any lime. The pH of the soil in East Texas is low and they add lime about every other year, but not here. Okay. Now let's look at the pH chart again. At about a pH of eight, your asparagus, bees, cabbage, and cantaloupe do very well up there. Now, if I bought a truck farm and I'm gonna to try to make a living, I want something that does very well in that high pH soil. And that would be asparagus, bees, cabbage, and muskmelon. Now, the rest of this stuff is very do very good in our pH range. Uh, as the pH drops or in a low pH, potatoes do very well in a low pH. And it also helps control uh, one of their, the fungus problems. Okay. So this is something that you might want to look at What do I plant? Well, in the small garden, let's look at economics. From an economical point of view, um, on the left here, these are gonna do pretty well in the small garden. We're gonna get the most money out of there as much as possible. Now in that small garden, you still might want some tomatoes or something that grows up on a vine, cucumbers, cantaloupe, or you could put it on the north or the west side of this, put your cage, a fence or some poles so these particular plants can grow up. And because they're on the north or west side of your garden, your smaller plants are getting that early morning sunlight that they really need. Now in the large garden, these are things that take up a lot of space. Collard, cucumber, cantaloupe, okra, potatoes, pumpkin, corn, sweet potatoes. Now, Sweet potatoes, I'm going to mention this right now. Sweet potatoes are started from slips. When you grow that sweet potato in the bottle in the window, that foliage that's coming off of there is called a slip. When it's about 18 inches long, you can cut that slip off, go out in the garden and take a broom handle and poke a hole and stick that slip down there until some of the foliage is still sticking out. Bring the soil up to it and it will develop roots. And one sweet potato can fill up a garden because they do produce a lot of foliage. When it comes to the maturity rate, in the winter, when you're sitting there drinking a cup of coffee and it's cold outside, you take this chart right here or you start planting your garden. As soon as you can plant, what are you gonna be able to plant? When you plant that one crop, how long will it be before that crop is through producing? Now, what do we wanna plant after that? You can plant a garden pretty well out for the whole year by a maturity rate here. Now, shallots, they say 30 to 60 days. Uh, the multiplier shallots usually go in the ground like uh, September, October, and they're gonna stay in the ground till uh, late May or June. And onions will do the same thing, okay? So this chart will help you make some decisions of what you want to plant and how long that particular plant will occupy that particular space. I think of a garden as never having any space exposed. This vegetable chart, there's a front and a back to it. And this is the spring side of the chart. And according to this, the 1st of March, we should be able to start planting However, 
I took the temperature of the soil of my garden this morning and it was 47 degrees. That tells me a lot of people that are planting right now, those seeds are going to rot in the ground because it's too cold. So we're going to have to figure out some way to overcome that. This is the fall chart. One thing I like to show about this right here, if you look at the corn, corn you can plant up to the middle of June according to this particular chart. Here in the fall, you're starting to planting it on August. And if you want corn at Thanksgiving, you can do it. Okay, this is the temperature that is required for most seeds to germinate. If you look at the green beans, they need the temperature between 60 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit, which 45 degrees is too cold for the green beans to germinate. So that means I have to wait. At 47 degrees, I can probably plant some beets. Uh, if you're gonna plant beets, they need to go in the ground pretty quick, but then they'll probably germinate, but we want them to produce before it gets very warm, okay? So this chart can be very beneficial. There are other charts out, charts out there that are available to you that might vary somewhat. The soil color is going to determine how, or how fast your soil warms up. A light colored soil will be slow. The dark soil will warm up faster. Because okay? we don't want to put those seeds out there and they rot. Vegetable seed life. This is those seeds that we have in the middle bags in there. We want to, how long will they last? Generally speaking, you know, on the left here on one year, uh, corn, spinach, onions, and lettuce definitely don't last much over a year at all. And the leek. Now, sweet corn, I've had it in a bag and last for five years and done pretty well. This is a generalization chart. Okay. Here, I want to mention that there, I went to a program one time and the guy was from a, they stored seeds for long-term keeping. They stored seeds so that someday if we ever needed to go back to those old seeds, they would be available. And what he talked about is pepper plants. They took the peppers, dried the seeds, stored them in freezing conditions. And their goal was to 40 years later, pull those seeds out of that freezer, plant them, recover those seeds and put them back in the freezer for another 40 years. That way, if something happened to our seed system in this country, they have a starting point that they can go back to. When it comes to seed germination, if we're in doubt if our seeds are any good or not, we can take 10 or 20 of them, put them in a moist paper towel, insert them in a plastic bag, and at the right temperature, uh, they should, the seed coat should break. Uh, germination is when the seed coat breaks. So at that time, that tells you that seed coat, that seed is good. Now, if you have 10 seeds in that container and the seed coats break, if nine of them germinate, that means you have a 90% germination rate, which that's pretty good. Now, if you have a 50% germination rate on them beans that you've got, that means you need to plant them twice as heavy because some of them are not going to come up. When it comes to seed planting, on the larger seeds, two or three times the width is about the depth you're going to plant these seeds. We've already talked about soil temperature and moisture. And let me tell you what I saw one time. It was in May, this girl was going to plant some green beans and she opened a furrow up and you could see in the soil that part of the furrow had moisture and part of it was powder. So I suggested that she take the water hose and water all of the bottom of the row so that all that bottom in there was now wet. It's moisture. She dropped the seeds, covered them up, packed them, and they all came up. Those seeds have to be in contact with moisture in order for them to germinate. There are some people that will actually go through the trouble of soaking their seeds, then planting them, 
And some people will sprout the seeds in a handkerchief or something, and then with a uh, tweezers, pick those sprouted plants up and put them in the soil. So basically what we do is on moist soil, we drop the seeds, cover them up to the right depth, and that can be different depth because uh, some seeds need uh, different and darkness and okay, but they also need we want to pack that sand or pack that soil on top. Now there are times when you're going to plant something and the ground is real rough and got a lot of clods. Get you some sand and just cover them up to the depth that you need. And they will go ahead and come up. Sometimes when you plant your seeds, you get a rain and now the soil or the silt on top kind of cakes and makes a hard thin surface. That's when I take that water hose. Every evening I will water that cake so that those seeds can break that cake and come up. Some seeds need light to sprout. Lettuce, celery, uh, some of the flowers and those small seeds. I don't have a list of all of them, but it's you need to take into consideration. When it comes to seed planting, I refer back to the seed charts on slide 21 and 22 and 23. Hopefully they're in order. Now, sometimes you may need to plant or want to plant when the soil temperature is rather high. Now, when it's cool, what I've done before is open up these little holes in the soil, drop the seed on moist soil and put the sand on top of it. Now, when it's warm, too warm for the seeds to come up, I will do the same thing here I may use the soil that's there, but I will put something over the top that blocks the sun from 10 o'clock in the morning till about three in the afternoon. Once those seeds germinate and break the surface of the soil, you can move your cover. But in order to get them up, I give them that midday shade because this, that soil can get rather high. The one thing that comes up in pretty warm temperatures is turnips. Now, in some of our gardens, we have a cat problem. Cats like that fresh turned over soil. I have several pieces of chicken wire that I use. Cats don't like chicken wire. Okay. I do some wide row planting, or I used to do quite a bit of it. I would take a garden that was worked up. And when I spread my feet, they're about 24 inches wide. So as I walk down this furrow here, and this one over here, they're about 24 inches wide. What I do is I want a flat top. I will open a furrows crossways on this bit, not lengthwise, but crossways, at about every six to eight inches apart. I may have this trench open about an inch deep or maybe a little deeper, depending on what I'm gonna plant. I will drop my seeds. Some things like lettuce and carrots, I don't even bother to put them in the furrow, I just broadcast them over the top of the row, rake them down, that covers most of them, pack them, and with adequate moisture, they come up. To me, this works very good for beets, uh, carrot, mustard turnips, and some of that small stuff like that. It's a lot in a small space. When it comes to uh, Transplanting what you've purchased in these containers, we want to make sure that it's root knot nematode free. That means you may have to actually pull it out of the container and look at it. Put it right back in though. Uh, when you're buying these tomato, bell pepper, eggplant in these containers, you want to look at that plant and what is the age of it? Uh, the height, you don't want it very tall. And what we would like to have in a lot of cases is about four true leaves. And we're gonna talk about the true leaves in a minute. We wanna take it and go ahead and plant it. Now, there's some of these things, and I'm gonna use broccoli as an example, that if your broccoli is going to make in 90 days and you buy a plant that is 60 days old, put it in your garden in 30 days, you've got a broccoli head. It may only be the size of a silver dollar, but the head is going to be there. So this is why it's important to, you want the young plants, not those old plants. 
when you buy your plants, you would like to set them out in your garden at the same depth as they were in the container. The exception is tomatoes. Tomatoes have what they call air roots. That stem has a lot of air roots that you probably can't see. So if you purchase your tomato plant in the last few days and you haven't planted it yet, the best thing to do is take an in your garden. Don't plant it in a deep hole. You dig a trench, lay it down, and cut all the other stems off. What I usually do is the top four inches of the stem, I leave it there. And from that stem back to the root, I'll cut all them uh, little leaves off. I will cover everything up except the top four inches of that plant. Those soils and the upper part, those roots or stem in the upper part of that soil where it's warm will develop roots and help develop your plant. You also want to water it well. Also, master gardeners, we are becoming more and more specialized. Uh, our Gervais does our programs on tomatoes. And for those wanting to grow the largest tomatoes in the neighborhood, his programs is probably where you really want to be. He has another one coming up at the end of this month, and that one covers the disease problems and things like that. I'm from the old school. On the left is my starter seed bed. And this particular bed, and most of these plants are too large anyhow, but it's, as an example, on the top right corner there, that is Paris Island romaine lettuce. I've already taken out all that I want, and this is still growing. Below that, in the kind of yellow leaves, that's the uh, black seeded Simpson, which is an open pollinated old variety. It's a leaf lettuce. On the top, on uh, top right of that one is the probably broccoli in there, and below there is celery. Okay, I grow these in there, and at the right time, I'm going to move them or transplant them into the garden. On the right is a plant that has come up. And when it comes up, the first two leaves, or we, what we call leaves, are called cotyledons. Those are not true leaves. Out of the center of here is going to come growth, and that's going to develop true leaves. Once it has developed three or four true leaves, I will then transplant it. When I say transplant it, I will go in here and wet the soil good, Use something to kind of kind of pick them up, take a handful of them and throw them in a container of water, a little flat pan of water, and then I'm going to go to where I'm going to plant these. So I go into the soil. I like to do this the latter part of the day when it's starting to cool down. I will go into the garden. I will dig the hole. I will put water in it so that it's moist. I will. I want the roots hanging, and then I'm going to backfill it. Then I'm going to water it again. The next morning, this plant is going to be standing up. You're going to be proud of yourself. Now, that evening is probably going to be laying down in a lot of cases. Then the next morning, it's going to be standing up. That evening, it may be drooping a little bit, but you're on your way. That means in a few days, you're going to be side dressing this with fertilizer to make it grow. You can take $2 worth of seeds and produce many, many plants in a lot of cases. You can actually start your own peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, a lot of this stuff, broccoli, cabbage. Now, we have a problem out there and the problem is a cutworm. And this is cutworm control, is a physical barrier. When this plant is out there, and this happens to be a pepper plant and you bought that plant out there and you put it in the garden if there's a cutworm out there, he'll come up there and he'll get around that plant and he'll cut it off. Now you done lost, what, two or $3? So let's try to do something to prevent that. Let's take one toothpick and put right down the side of it because that worm has to get around that plant. That's a physical barrier. Now I'm the guy with two insurance policies, okay? So I got two toothpicks. I don't want that cutworm cutting down my plant. Now we mentioned the plants that you just purchased, but in our small gardens, we don't have many plants to begin with. Once they come up, we may need to do this. If you have something that's been cut off, 
scratch around in the soil and look for that worm that looked like he's laying out there in a circle. Let's get rid of him, give him to the chickens. Now, this particular one is, is a cut worm. This right here, I believe is another worm, but see how he's laying in a circle? This is the way that cut worm is gonna be laying out there. There's 14 different named cut worms. They're night feeders, subterranean cut worms, tunnel dwellers, surface feeders, and some climbing cut worms, okay? So we wanna control these because we don't wanna lose that, whatever we pay for that pollen. Now that your plants are growing, transplant them for a couple of days, we need to side dress those. And we're gonna do this. We're gonna fertilize, okay, when you plant, you normally fertilize. Most literature from a and says two to three pounds of complete fertilizer per hundred square feet, you till it in and then you plant your garden, okay? Now we have the plants are growing and they're growing up. And so we're going to fertilize those. Most plants need nitrogen. Now, Tomatoes need nitrogen too, but not much. Too much nitrogen on your tomatoes makes them grow very tall and you may not even develop any fruit, okay? So in this case, we're gonna use nitrogen. These are onions right here and we're gonna side this, dress those. If you look this little dark spot, the furrow has been opened up in there about an inch deeper, a little bit deeper. The fertilizer has been spread in there and now we're gonna cover that up and we're gonna water it in. Now, with the 2100, it's gonna take a little time for the microbes in the soil to, con to convert the 2100 to a form that your plants can use. With the 4600, it is already in a form that your plants can use. So it's quicker. Now, now I have taken some things and broadcast like chicken feed the 4600 on the soil and water it, spray with nozzle till it all dissolved and went into the soil. And that works very good. When you put out this nitrogen, if you sprinkle it on the yard or whatever, you would like to water it in at a relatively, and we usually say sh within three hours. However, there are charts that indicate you can wait, uh, depending upon the temperature, up to a couple of days. Now, this is onions. With onions, we don't want the 2100, maybe, because 2100 has sulfur. Sulfur on your onions will give them, or make them have a tendency to be hot in flavor. So you may not want that. But on the other hand, you may want it. Your choice. When it comes to mulch, mulch, when you water the soil, what we would like to do is, or when you water your garden, we want to water the soil, not the leaves. If for some reason you have to water the top of the plant and the leaves, you would like to do it very early in the morning so that those leaves dry off early in the day. If that moisture is on there too long, it may cause or develop a fungus, and we don't want fungus problems. Mulch slows water evaporation. So if you have mulch down and you've watered it in, that mulch prevents the evaporation or slows it down, okay? It helps eliminate weeds in your garden. If you need to warm your soil up, you could mulch with black plastic. And in some case, you may want to warm the soil up. And then once the soil gets to a temp certain temperature, you may want to remove that black plastic so it doesn't get hot. At that, at that point, you may want to mulch it to prevent the rise of the temperature. We can use leaves, hay, newspaper, decom uh, decomp and all of this stuff decomposes them. Newspapers, the ink is made with a uh, soybean oil base, and it's not the hazardous material that they used to use, okay? I use strips of old carpet cut about 12, 18 inches wide and I can move it anywhere I want it. And it works very well for me. Uh, one thing I wanna mention about horse hay. If you're getting horse manure from a barn to where they have high dollar horses and the hay there has no weeds in it, chances are that hay was raised in a meadow where it was sprayed, sprayed with grazon, which is a broadleaf weed killer. 
You can take the manure from those horses that ate that hay, compost it, put it in your garden, and the grazon, the broadleaf weed killer, is still active. So if you're going to use this hay, you want to, if it's got weeds in it, it's probably okay to use because it hadn't been uh, treated with uh, grazon. Weeding and weeds remove the thief. In dry land farming, weeds are thieves because they don't get that much rain. So weeds rob your moisture and they fertilize you. So if you pull them up, you can recycle them. But the nitrogen they have when it dries, it's back into the atmosphere. We don't want that. We would like to put that green material in and underneath the brown stuff. Okay. Uh, weeds at the edge of your garden uh, is a place for your insects in hiding. They can stay there. Know your weeds. I had an experience of a lady that was offered to weed my garden. When I got through, there was no beast left. So that's important. Those small plants are hard to tell what they are sometimes. If you're going to use a hoe to shallow, hoe to weed, excuse me, if you're going to use a hoe, you want a hoe shallow for weeds. What you want to do is cut them off just below the surface of the ground. Now, you don't want the hole real deep and cut the roots of your plants because your plant's roots are probably about an inch below the surface of the soil. When it comes to working this soil, if you work it all up, every time you bring this new soil to the top of the garden, there's probably be more new seeds coming up that are going to germinate. So minimum tilling or pulling up your weeds might be the best way to go. I have used Roundup in a garden before. There was a summer when it was very dry. I had green beans that were wide rows and I actually took Roundup and the technique, a similar technique would be put Roundup in a bucket that's mixed, use a mop, wring out most of it and drag it down. And I was dragging it over the top of nut grass and you could see the sheen on the top of the grass and it would die. Of course, there's more seeds down that are gonna come back at more. But the method that I used was called wicking. I would not spray because spray carries a lot of residue that might be harmful to my other plants. This is nice to know. I asked Dr. Johnson one time about uh, nitrogen in the air. Well, the nitrogen in the air, our plants can't use. But there was a study done in Iowa. Excuse me, I'm getting confused here. Okay. There was a study done in Iowa in reference to cloudy days and the light intensity. The light intensity was reduced when you had 25% to 50% cloud reduction on partly cloudy to cloudy days. And the sunlight reduction was 60% on rainy days. This is something to think about because we want that sunlight. We plan in the sunlight for a reason. Okay, let me start over here now. There was a study done in the Tennessee Valley when it rained with lightning. And we know our plants can't use that nitrogen in the air. So when it rained with lightning, the nitrogen was converted to a form that our plants can use and the rain brought it to the surface of the ground. If you could recover all of that nitrogen that came down in one inch of rain on an acre of soil, it would equal to 20 pounds of 2100. Now, if you had three inches of rain over the summer, that could be about 60 pounds of nitrogen over that one acre. Now, after that rain last night, we look at our plants this morning and talk about how green they look if we had the lightning with the rain. When it comes to spring vegetables, we want to say, when does spring start? According to our spring vegetable planting guides, we think spring charted, started at the edge, at the beginning of March. But the soil temperature, like I said, is 47 degrees. We have a chart that tells what seeds germinate at what temperature. Now, normally we could transplant the plants of 
broccoli, cabbage, eggplant, peppers, and tomatoes right now. The things that we could plant in the soil right now, if the soil is warm enough, and some of these will work, collard, kohlrabi, lettuce, and mustard, and radish, and turnip, and beets, chard, they would come up real good right now. However, the cucumber, the southern peas, or the cow peas, and the summer squash, uh, it's going to take the soil to come up a little uh, more in temperature. Cantaloupe, we want a temperature of 60 degrees plus up. April, uh, April, we're going to plant our okra after the temperature is 68 degrees and up. And uh, we talked about on slide 20 about transplanting plants. Now, I knew a friend, and when he was young and lived in uh, Winnie, they raised okra for the commercial market and they raised okra plants in hotbed and transplant them into the garden later on. I plant a garden like it's never going to freeze. Frost guard, if you have a piece of it, works very good to protect some of your things when you have that one night of frost. Now, let me tell you something else I do. I plant mustard in round tubs. This is cattle liquid, liquid feed tubs. Two of those tubs with mustard in them when the first leaves get to be about eight to 10 inches long, I pick them. I pick everything that's over about three inches long, wash them and we use them. But I add another layer of more nitrogen and water. And then those plants will grow fast enough in seven to 10 days, they're ready to pick again. And they usually grow so fast, the insects don't have time to find them. Okay, we want to harvest at its peak. We want the cool of the day when the leaves are drying because we don't want to move that fungus down the row that might be on a couple of plants. I like to handle them carefully because uh, I, I think vegetables are beautiful. We want to chill them down quick so that they retain their nutrients and everything. Now, tomatoes, once they're picked, once they're fully ripe, we can put those in the refrigerator and they will go ahead and keep for some times. Now, if you look at this right here, there's some tomatoes, cucumbers, and squash in there. But if you look real close at the green beans, you see those kind of like knots. Those green beans have stayed on the plant too long. They would have to be shelled, and then you could eat the green pods in the middle. A lot of people won't see that, but it's there. Now, I want to mention legumes. Legumes are beans, peas, and stuff like that. And this is important. Uh, these are legumes and they are able to produce or help produce nitrogen into the soil. Uh, pinto beans can produce 120 pounds per acre. There are some trees that are legumes, uh, the mesquite, the mimosa, eastern redbud, and a poison bean, which is a weed that is in many pastures out there, is the same thing. In order for these to produce this nitrogen, these roots of these plants need a an inoculum or a bacteria called rhizobia in the soil. Most of our soil has that. If you plant a legume and when you dig it up, you look at the roots, and if you have these little white knots on them, you have that bacteria in the soil. In the north, as the, when the temperatures drop down low and the soil freezes, they have to apply that bacteria every year to the roots of their legumes. Okay, let me go further on the root knot nematode. On the left, these are nitrogen nodules that are attached to the root. Okay, now I'm saying they're attached to the root. If you look right here, this is the root of a legume. This is clover. And these roots right here, you can actually take and break them, separate them real easy because they are attached to the root. They're not the root. That's really the difference. Now, over here, this is root knot nematode on bean or cucumber. And if you look, you have a root. And then right here, the skin goes around that ball. Inside of there is root knot nematode. It is actually part of the plant, whereas the nitrogen, you can separate it with your fingers. Um, 
there's a lot of plants that are susceptible to this. There are ways to control it. You may never get rid of it, but you can control it somewhat. When you see plants that wilt early in the day, look at the roots. You may have the root knot nematode underneath the plant. Okay, when it comes to crop rotation, when you look at the nightshade family, that's tomatoes, uh, potatoes, eggplant, and peppers, some of these are subject to root knot nematode. But what we want to do is we want to change this out. If you have a bed where you've got tomatoes one year, let's plant something else the following year. Because if you plant tomatoes every year, like a guy I used to know, he planted a couple hundred tomato plants every year, same place. Eventually, what happened is he would lose a few tomato plants one year. The next year, he lost a few more. This is because of disease in the soil. Had he rotated this with other groups, he probably wouldn't have had this problem, okay? We talk about the raised bed construction. We need deep, well-drained, fertile, friable soil. For carrots, we, won't, we don't want any sticks or rocks. When I, in my, where I raise carrots, I actually sift the soil so that if there's nothing there will cause the carrot to split. If you have a shallow soil and it's hard below that, you can have that hard pan soil will make your carrots short, very short. Poor drainage can do this also. And I'm gonna tell you something, kids love pulling carrots up. Now I wanna show you something right here. If you look right here, there's a couple of little knots right there on that root. There's a couple of knots over here and there's a couple of knots there. That's root knot nematode. In the winter time, when the soil is cooler, the root knot nematode doesn't grow nearly as fast as it does in the warm parts of the year. Beets, I've seen beets with the root knot nematode also. Beans and cucumbers and okra and stuff like that. Now, when it comes to beets, and I'm not gonna talk about a lot of different vegetables. I'm hoping you already got enough material to where you can uh, make a lot of decisions yourself, okay? Spring vegetable planting guide. It indicates we should be planting right now, but because of the soil temperature, we may be waiting for a little bit, okay? Uh, when it comes to beets, many people have problems with beets. They said I can't get them up. Most people are probably planting them too shallow. Beets need at least an inch deep, maybe a little bit different. They need a soil temperature of between 50 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to broadcast that fertilizer in, turn it, and plant your seeds. Now, when you plant your seeds and you think you've planted one seed, it's probably actually a, a seed cluster that may have two to six seeds attached to it. So that means when you plant what you think is one seed, you may have four or five plants come up right there, and they're going to be too thick. Now, I mentioned a while ago, uh, you can plant them in row crop. That's a long, thin row or the wide row planting that I like. When they come up probably two or three inches deep, we want to thin them to about two to three inches apart. Okay. Now, we can transplant those. You dig them up, don't disturb the roots, transplant them. And they will do pretty well. Not quite as good as cabbage and broccoli, but they do work pretty well. Then we want to side dress them after they're probably about four or five inches tall to make them grow. I have a friend that calls me the forcer because I know that nitrogen will make things grow. Now, when they're about two inches in diameter or whatever, you may want to start harvesting them or whatever size you want. The, be the greens are edible. You know, they're kind of like Swiss chard, but they are edible. Now, in this garden of mine, I decided I'm not going to plant a row. So I got the soil worked up. It's that trial. You just work it with a hand. And with a pencil with a rubber band on it to mark or gauge the depth, I stuck holes in here about three or four inches apart. I dropped one seed in each hole. They're at the right depth. I covered them up and packed them. 
everything come up and they're beautiful. Now on the right is the Detroit dark, which is a very popular old variety, which does very well in our area. And I like the pickled beets. Okay, some of my garden is liquid cow feed tubs. You find a guy that's got these cattle and he's using these and he probably has more of these than he can use and he gives them away. So in these, right here on the left, this is one, it's got good drainage in the bottom. This is carrots. You can graze carrots in there that are eight, 10 inches long, nice size carrots. And in the fall, there's nothing better than walking through the garden, eating that fresh carrot. Now on the right, there's lettuce. This is Romaine, Paris Island. I have about 12 or 15 of these in the garden right now, and I like them. You don't have to steep over, stoop over as far. You know, two of these with mustard greens in it, like I said, will produce plenty of mustard greens and pick them about every seven to 10 days. I grow squash in these. One squash plant does very well in these. Two is pushing it a little bit, but they still do very well. I've raised cucumbers in them, uh, all your lettuce and smaller plants. When it comes to lettuce, uh, lettuce was introduced to the Bahamas in 1492 by Mr. Columbus. It's a member of the composite family. We have leaf lettuce, butterhead, romaine, and iceberg, which is a head lettuce. Uh, let's scratch the iceberg or the head lettuce and don't even try it because it's rather difficult to develop here. Uh, leaf lettuce, butterhead, and romaine. They're all kind of a semi-head. The black seed of Simpson is a leaf lettuce that is an old open, open pollinated variety that I remember as a kid they were planting it. The negative point on it is that when you take that one leaf off of that stalk, near the stalk is wide, thick foliage. Then you have medium sized leaf thickness. And then at the very tip, you have this leaf that's very thin. And that's what gets up in your roof of your mouth that you can't get out. But lettuce does very well here. Uh, most of it, produces in 70, 45 to 70 days to harvest. It's a cool weather crop. It'll germinate at 32 degrees to 85 degrees. The other day after the freeze, I had some lettuce in a tub. The lettuce melt, wilted down. I pulled it up, threw it away. And the seeds that were left over in that soil from the time I planted that other lettuce now came up within just only a couple of days after the freeze. The optimum temperature is 75 degrees. It needs light to sprout. They transplant very well and they need a pH of six and up. They need cool, moist soil. Mulch slows the temperature and prevents the leaves from touching the soil, which reduces a fungus problem. I try to grow it all winter long. I use a frost guard if necessary, okay? Now, okay, storage. Stores well in the refrigerator from 35 to 45 days, no, 35 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit for five to 15 days. If you have lettuce, you picked it and it's bitter, put it in the refrigerator for a couple of days and try it again. I've got, over, I've got here, they've got over 25 different varieties of lettuce. But if you look around, there's a lot more than that. I was at a master gardener convention in Wichita Falls. We went out to a greenhouse. They were raising tomatoes hydroponically on, this was Mother's Day. They had slanted pipes with holes in them and growing their lettuce. They had a shade cloth over the top of this, this greenhouse. In the morning, the lettuce is standing up. In the evening, it's laying down. The market was Dallas, Texas. Now, these guys are in it for the money. What I learned from this is that with some shade in the heat of the year or late spring and early fall, we can grow lettuce here. Maybe take a little bit more effort, but if there's no lettuce in the store, it may be worth it. Now, top left is a variety of lettuce called freckles. It's just a different variety. Uh, 
to the bottom left, uh, the bright green is Black Seated Simpson, which is an old variety. Top right is uh, Paris Island uh, Romaine. And on the bottom right is a lettuce that has gone to seed. It is Crawford reseeding lettuce that I save the seeds every year. And it does very well. There is this particular lettuce is coming up in my driveway and many places in the yard. So uh, Jackie can harvest it anywhere she wants. But I like this uh, and Jackie approves of it also. And that's important. Okay, when it comes to asparagus, Thomas Jefferson's bed is still in production. So that means you want a permanent place if you're going to raise asparagus. We need full sun, deep well-drained soil. Now, a long time ago, the literature from the, the USDA said you needed crowns. That's a root system that was 18 inches in diameter. I could never find anything that size. So I planted seeds. Two years later, I gave those 18 inch diameter crowns to a neighbor and she planted them. Normally, you have to wait about two years for your asparagus before a harvest. In reality, it's probably longer than that. Okay, a hundred foot long bed should produce you about 30 pounds of asparagus. Many years ago in Alta Loma, there was a Tamarilla that produced asparagus for Galveston and Galveston was his market, okay? I have at times walked down the Santa Fe Railroad and Santa Fe area and there would be asparagus coming up everywhere and growing in the, in the railroad track. When I grew this asparagus and gave it to Sue, these two year old crowns, she planted them and that spring she started harvesting them. She is still harvesting or up until recently before she passed away, she was still harvesting that uh, asparagus, okay? At first she told me when I told her, oh no, you gotta wait. She said, Herman, I may not have that long because she was an elderly woman and it did produce well for her. A lot of times on some of these plants, we think we have to do certain things or in a certain uh, uh, place we need to grow this stuff, rules we have to follow, but nature is very forgiving to us. Now, the biggest problem I think some people do is they cut this fern back in the summertime, and this fern needs to grow all summer so that in the winter, just before it starts producing down here, because we may not have a freeze, we cut it down, fertilize and water it, mulch it, and then in the spring when they get our shoots coming up, we want to break them if possible. Uh, when they quit breaking or they're tough, you stop. And we have male and female plants. It's best if you get the ones with the seeds get those out because as those seeds fall, you're gonna actually have more weeds. Now, sweet corn will germinate from 50 to 95 degrees. It's quite common in some areas, you'll see corn coming up in mid-February. You wanna plant a block, that's four rows. You want them deep, an uh, inch deep. You want them three or four inches apart in the row. The rows may be 30 to 36 inches apart. The reason those guidelines are there is because that's how wide a mule was a long time ago. Okay, we wanna thin those plants to probably about, uh, we say 12 inches apart, they'll work at eight inches apart. When they are 12 and 24 inches tall, we wanna side dress with nitrogen. We wanna pull that soil up over the roots because the tree, this plant has anchor roots because without the anchor roots, when you get a lot of rain and a lot of wind, they'll be laying on the ground. They have a variety called early sun glow that, yeah, that produces in 60 days. They're short, they're small ears. You can almost plant a garden from the edges of it and never have to step into it. They have Funks G90 hybrid, which is a bicolor. It produces in 85 days. Don't save the seeds because it is a hybrid. And here again, I mentioned a while ago about planting them 85 days before Thanksgiving. So we have roast nears at Thanksgiving. Sweet corn. Dead corn is the corn that they raise in the field for the cattle. At a couple of days a year, it's plump. This is the one where you boil the, start the water boiling and then go pull the corn because the sugar converts to starch very fast. 
they have varieties now with the SU and the SU1 that the sugar turns to starch, but it's slower. And they've eventually got the SH2 where the sugar stays in this corn for a longer period of time before it is converted to starch. Uh, normally on sweet corn, we almost don't even recommend it because it takes a lot of space. This is a block, it's a cluster of corn. Now these tassels, tassels here, pollen is gonna come off of those tassels. And when it does, we want it to fall on these silks. Any silk that does not get pollinated causes a potential grain of corn on the cob not to develop. Here is pollen right here. And if you have the chance to see a field of corn that the pollen is in the air, it's like a golden haze out there, it's beautiful. This corn right here, the dark silks, this is probably ready to pull. When you pull enough of them, you can go through and feel that corn ear, see if it's ready to pull. Now here, these right here, uh, they're leaning over. I don't know if they've been anchored and healed in, but just let them lay because they sunlight has a way to bring them back up to where they're supposed to be. This is a inside of an ear of corn that's fairly green yet. Now, if you look at these silks to each grain of corn, if that silk at the end has not been pollinated, it's not going to develop a kernel there. Now, let's look at something over here. Over here, we see some corn. Look like the corn earworm got the tip. The reason in the store there's no earworms in there because we're not going to buy it if there's an earworm in there. But if you're raising it at the house, well, I don't worry about that earworm. Now let's look at this cob right here. Earworm damage. If you look right here, there's some blank spots on this grain of corn, this ear of corn in the same way over here. That could mean that uh, maybe it was real tangled up at the end or if it's raining and washes this pollen off, it may not get to these grains. So you could almost have a crop of cobs with no corn on them. Okay, and here again, this is what we call a nubbin, which these have been pollinated and these haven't. It could be that it got dry and this couldn't develop or whatever. There are things that can go wrong. When it comes to green beans, it's a warm season legume. This is the one that if there's the rhizome, is, if, the, if the rhizobia is in the soil, you're gonna have uh, nitrogen on the roots. Here again, one to two pounds of complete fertilizer per hundred square feet, plant about an inch deep, maybe two, and they're gonna come up if the soil is warm. And normally we're gonna say we plant in March the first, and about 10 days later, we plant another batch of it. So that we have one that when it's right, when they're ready, we're gonna pick them for a week or two, and then the next batch will be ready to pick. So about 20 days, you'll have green beans. We want to thin these to probably about three inches apart. We're gonna hold for weeds or whatever, and we wanna be careful not to damage our roots on these. Some of the varieties that I like is there's top crop contender in the Blue Lake. Now, when it comes to pole beans, everybody remembers the Kentucky Wonder. Nope, not anymore. The Kentucky Wonder that I remember has strings on them. You could actually snap them, pull the strings off them, and there were still strings there. And when you were eating, it was almost like eating green beans with pieces of hay on it, dry hay. Now, when it comes to the pole beans, the stringless Blue Lake pole bean works pretty well. Uh, the pole beans need a support. Uh, pole beans will produce over a longer period of time. That means you have to pick them more often and they will actually produce more in the same area. Uh, I grow them in these containers like this. And Jackie will go out every few days when they're ripe and she'll pick whatever she wants or whatever's needed, okay? And then once they've come out, what can I plant in that container then? Okay, These are green beans that are planted and they're very thick. Well, I can pull them up, but if I pull some up, what happens to the roots of the plants that I leave? Am I going to damage them? So how about use a pair of scissors and cut the other ones out, leave what I want, and I have not disturbed the roots. When you're growing your green beans, you go out there and you find the leaf kind of tucked under with some look like silk on it. 
open it up and you'll find a bean leaf roller there. They may eat a little bit of leaf, but normally they're not that much damage. And here are the eggs that these things hatched from. And here is the long tail skipper that laid those eggs. When it comes to the eggplant, first of March, we would like to transplant these six to, when they're six to eight inches tall. We would like a pH of five to 5.7, which is kind of low for our area, but we're gonna use what we got. Three pounds of fertilizer per 100 square feet until it in. We want to plant these at the same depth as they are in the container, because most likely we're gonna buy them in a container because we're only gonna need a couple. And several weeks after they're planted, we're gonna side dress them. Side dressing could mean uh, a tablespoon to two tablespoons of uh, a complete fertilizer around the plant or down the row. If it's around the plant, uh, uh, one to two tablespoons around the plant, probably about eight inches away from the plant, watered in will work very well. Sometimes these plants grow large enough where you may need to support them with something, okay, like a wire cage or whatever. You want to harvest these before the seeds before the seeds come hard. You want to actually pick these before they get to fully maturity, because you don't want that tough, uh, bitter fruit. Okay, uh, the temperature above eighty-five degrees with a, a low moisture can actually cause bitter fruit, and we don't want that. And normally, when people grow eggplant, they produce so much that the neighbors go inside and hide from them when they come down the street. The large fruit developed or was developed in India. And the smaller eggplants actually were developed and came from China. Now, if you have yellow leaves, the, re the recommendation is, is pull those yellow leaves off, fertilize and water it like you're trying to kill it, and, and let's wait for another crop, okay? Here you have damage on the leaves, which is flea beetles, okay? So they may or may not be a problem. You may need to use an insecticide depending on what kind of damage you have. Here again, integrated pest management. And yes, hornworms have been known to be on uh, your eggplant and aphids also can be on there too. Aphids, we're gonna wash them off with a water hose. Aphids will be on your okra too. Wash them off with a water hose. And here there's a drip system on eggplants. They're about 18 to 24 inches apart. And on the right, 80 to 90 days or sooner, we're gonna pull them, but we're gonna cut the stem because the stem is very tough. You can't just hardly pull them. When it comes to peppers, uh, Gene Spiller is our go-to man for peppers. And he's extremely knowledgeable about not just bell peppers, but all peppers. On the 1st of March, we're going to try to get our transplants out if we can. Fertilize until the soil. We're going to transplant the same depth. Uh, peppers need a lot of nitrogen. Okay. I have used support on these because some of these plants can get quite large. And when I say quite large, I've seen times the plants were very large and I actually trimmed them or pruned them like you would a tree and more new growth comes out, okay? But nitrogen is, is a must. When those plants develop, the first, uh, when the bell pepper, the first uh, fruit, let's remove that large one, the first one that's up, because we want a larger plant that's going to produce more fruit. Okay, if you're gonna plant the seeds, you want a soil temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit plus. Now, overwatering peppers if you have a, a fungus in the problem can, or, or a bacteria, you can actually cause a root rot that can kill your pepper plant. So what you would like to do when watering the peppers, you want to water and then let it dry out somewhat, okay? So eight to 10 weeks after transplanting, you should be picking your peppers. They will turn red if you leave them on the plant long enough. And here again, Gene Spiller, when it comes to peppers, he's our go-to guy. I use quite often a plant called Big Bertha, which makes a very large pepper. 
You know, on the right is the uh, banana peppers that are caged because these plants, they're kind of brittle. They're kind of like squash plants. Cucurbits. That's a, we're going to mention the cucumbers right quick. They have slicers. They have pickles. And when we plant them, we want the soil temperature to be 65 and up. We want to plant them one to two inches of, in depth, about 36 inches apart. We want to thin the plants. We want good airflow to remove the moisture because we don't want the fungus problems. We're going to water fertilize wheat and mulch. They do very well on a fence. They grow up high. And you'll probably have to pick these every day. Bees are a must because they have to have pollination. I will later on do a program on cucuberts only, and it's quite fascinating. On the summer squash, they have the yellow squash, the patty pan, and the zucchini. Yellow squash is my favorite. We want a soil temperature 65 and up when we plant them, just like we do uh, the cucumbers. And bees here again are, are a must. Now, I want to mention hand pollination because we may have to. In some places, there's not any bees. Uh, these, are, these plants are monoecious, which means they have male and female blooms. When you look at a squash, cucumber, winter squash, you have a fruit which is going to bloom. This is the female. This stem with the, with the this, and this will bloom, is the male. There's two parts. Here again, bees are a must. Now, a demonstration of this would be in the bottom photograph. If you have the fruit that normally would have the petals on it, it opens in the morning. And at the same day, you want a male, which is the one on the right, the stem with the pollen on the end. You want to have this. So you want to, the pollen to go from the male to the female. If that does not happen, this does not develop. I usually hand pollinate these at times. I pulled and used the stem for that purpose. I've also used a brush. And if you use a brush, you want to look and make sure that the pollen will stick to the brush because if, it's, if the hairs are not right, it may not stick to it. I've used a Q-tip before. But, the, but this right here, with no petals on it, inserted into the flower that's behind the uh, female, works very well. Do this early in the morning, probably between about 8 and 11 or somewhere in there, and it works real well. Now, when it comes to okra, I love okra. You need a soil temperature of 75 degrees up. Some people will soak their seeds. And I've never soaked my seeds. Well, okay. This thrives in high heat, high humidity. Uh, it needs drainage, but it still works pretty well in moist soil, very moist soil. Uh, when you talk about varieties and distance between the rows, the different okra has different sizes. You have some that is short, some that is very tall. You're going to produce it, you're going to harvest it daily. I do not cut, I snap. And then I want to cool them down early so that they, they don't uh, lose this quality and appearance. There are dwarf varieties and a lot of them that grow an eight foot tall. There's a crimson spinous, the crimson, crimson, crimson spinous that is supposed to not have spines, but I find that seem like all of them do have some spines. I wear gloves to harvest these with. They have a cow horn okra that gets eight and 10 foot tall that makes a very large okra pod. And if you grow them fast, you can pick these about once every six or seven days. And the, and the pod is large enough and tender enough that you can cut and fry. Okay. Now, I use a variety called uh, Z-Best, uh, which is a fairly large okra and I grow it different than most people. Okay. In the winter, okay. Let it go. Okay, here he's harvesting daily, you know. It's almost a must. Now later on in the summer, your plants are going to get very tall like this. And what you do is you come in here about 18 inches above the ground and just cut them off. 
and they will do like a tree. They will sprout new limbs and produce more fruit for you. Now, this is the variety that I use, which is Z-Best, which is an open pollinated variety. And a lot of times I don't have the room to plant these. So what I do is in that backyard, I find a place between some peach trees or something. And I, said, and I have enough room for a couple of plants here. And what I do is I take the weed eater and I'll cut this down to the soil. Then I take the shovel and take about a half inch off the top, about the size of your hand, throw it off to the side, work it up with a little bitty pick or something, water it real, real good for about three times, you know, maybe an hour and an hour and an hour, so that there's plenty of moisture there. And then I will open it up, drop a handful of seeds, cover it up, and they sprout. The next thing you're going to see me do is I'll go out there with a weed eater and cut around them. And then I may use a pair of scissors to make sure there's no weeds close. And then shortly after this size here, I'm going to start thinning them out because I only want two plants at each place and about two and a half, three feet apart. They're going to grow. They're going to produce me all the okra that I want. I will never till this soil. In the fall when they're through, I will cut them off right at the ground and compost the stalks and everything. It's easy, it's quick, and it does work for me. So here again, there is no right or wrong. When it comes to southern peas, that's the black eyes. Purple hull and cream peas, they're a hot weather lagoon. They need a lot of space, a half a pound of fertilizer per hundred square feet. Soil temperature of a minimum of 65. Here again, the rows are 36 to 48 inches apart, depending upon the variety, because some varieties produce a lot of vine. I used to take them and broad, just throw these seeds on the ground and till them in. Then I would till out what I didn't want and leave a row. Some varieties produce the peas on the top. Some the peas will be down in the bush. Stink bugs can be a problem sometimes. I usually tell people, you're going to have aphids, so just be prepared for them. Now, these are some of the varieties that are out there, and the Dixie Lee and the Mississippi Silver are root knot nematode resistant. Here is a row of peas on the right. These are ready to pick and shell. And when you're shelling them, this is what you would like to pick up. And when I say this, I want to do this. Now, you see that little dark spot on that pea? This is probably caused by a sting bug. And if you have a lot of sting bugs, you, these may be covered on little black specks. And we don't like that. So we're going to try to get rid of those stink bugs somehow. Now, worms. Bacillus thuringiensis will control these. Their, the brand names may be BT, Thuricide Dipal, Bio Worm Killer. It comes in liquid, a concentrate, a, and a dust. Now, what happens is when you mix and apply this, this worm or caterpillar, which is an offspring of Lipidopteria in that family, when they consume this, they quit eating almost immediately. They die from dehydration. When, you, when they consume it, they may live 24 hours. It gives excellent control for the leaf-eating caterpillars. Uh, the BT does degrade. So I like to spray it right at dark, on good coverage underneath the plants. I will add a surfactant so that it sticks well to the leaves. Uh, they must consume, consume that bacteria and then death within about 24 hours. So BT, when you spray active on the plants, it's, a, it's there for about three days. So you may have to apply it again. You don't want to use this near the butterfly garden unless you don't like that person. Now, okay. I usually add water, surfactant, the BT and spray. Now I used BT one time in a sprayer and I set it in the garage and did not empty it. 20 days later, I got these little hornworms on my tomatoes one day. So I picked these off and I knew they're coming back the next day. So I went out there the next morning. Sure enough, at seven o'clock, these little worms are there. I sprayed them with the BT that had been sitting in a garage in a container for 20 days. In three hours, I came back. They were not eating anymore. 
I know they're going to die. Now, the harvest. Last slide. What I want to show you here, this is the 6th of June. This is just a sample of what your backyard can produce. These pickles right here are Calypso. People like these large pickles better, better than they do cucumbers because they're tender, crisp, and the skin is thinner. And the seeds are smaller. Uh, this okra over here is Stewart's Z Best. This is the first picking, three or four okra. That's it. Here's that open, open pollinated heirloom, the green beans right here. This is the last green beans of the season. Okay. Then we have this black zucchini squash over here that the daughter likes. And here is uh, yellow summer squash, Midas 2. It's, it's a uh, powdery mildew resistant variety, one of the few that I can find. And there's a tomato in there called Juliet, which is a small, love it. Beautiful tomato. Produces late into the season. Then there's early pick, which is a medium size. Then there's the 4th of July. And then we have Tropic Snow, white flesh peaches in that container. Now, that is a variety. Now, when all of this is producing, Jackie stays busy. I am ready for your questions. And hopefully you got everything you needed and if not, we will try to fill those voids in. I think the main thing with this is um, nature is not strict on a lot of things. It's, it's a lot of variables out there. 